I'm Bob Wells. I am the, I guess I'm the past president of the Ottoman Society of Omaha, and I've had the pleasure think, uh, to introduce a, a friend and mentor of mine, Mitt, who's going to talk to us tonight about sparrow identification. Oh, I have... <laughs> don't start. A surprise, surprise guest. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I think it is, as Mary and everybody has a, has a, said, it's it's an appropriate time to, to go through this so we can all find all these sparrows. So go for it, Rick. All right. So um, I think I know most everybody, um, most everybody on the on the on the Zoom tonight. I saw some names come by that I didn't know. Um, my name is Rick Schmid. Uh, I've been birding for over 50 years. I've been banding for about 25 years. I am from Nebraska, but I live in Stillwater, Minnesota now. Uh, I'm a previous board member and employee of Fontenot Forest and a previous board member of the Audubon Society of Omaha. Uh, but I'm not a professionally trained ornithologist by any means. So I welcome any comments you have. Uh, and especially if you think I have said something that is incorrect, um, please, please jump in. We don't, we don't need anybody to be learning wrong things. It's hard enough to learn the right things. Um, I'm okay if, if you wanna jump in and ask questions at any time during the presentation, I'd like for it to be very informal. Uh, we'll have some time for question and answers at the end, depending on how long you wanna stick around. Uh, but if I've said something that's confusing or you, you don't understand, uh, go ahead and you know raise your hand. Uh, as my friend Jared says, raise your hand if you're falling behind. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention before we uh, roll in, roll on here, is that um, all of the photos that I used in the presentation tonight are from Phil Swanson, who's also on the Zoom tonight, unless otherwise noted. There are and there are some others that that are noted. Um, Many of you know, especially in the Omaha community, that Phil is a very accomplished birder and photographer. Uh, he's ranked very high nationally in terms of number of spe species photographed in the U.S. I, last I knew he was in the top 15 and if you include Hawaii in the top 10 somewhere. And uh, the Omaha birding community is really very fortunate to have Phil around. And I'm very fortunate to have Phil as a friend uh, mm -hmm. with the presentation. So thanks, Phil. Um, so are, are you seeing, are, are you are you just seeing the screen or are you seeing other, are you seeing like people who are in the waiting room on your screens or are you just seeing my slides? I see you and a slide in the corner. Okay, well, you should be able to fix that. How? I don't know. <laughs> I'm an, I'm old. I don't know how these things work. Yeah, there's a, if you go up to, the, go up to the top, there should be like a view button, I think. And you should be able to change the view. You. To what? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Oh. What if I you mess, no. Yvonne, you mess with that. We're oh, going to move on. I got it. I figured Great. it out. Now you're a little in the corner. Much better. Much and better. Your slide, your slide is up there. If you play around with it long enough, you can probably eventually send me off the planet. You'll be very That happy. would be wonderful. Yeah, exactly. So the birds we're mostly talking about tonight are the sparrows that are native to North America. And they include most of the birds um, in the U.S. that have common names that, in, that include the word sparrow, like shipping sparrow and field sparrow and song sparrow. But there are some birds that have the word sparrow in their name that are not actually truly sparrows, and we'll talk about that. And the sparrow group also includes towhees and juncos, but we're not going to talk about them tonight, um, just in the interest of time. Um, so... If you've seen my sparrow presentations before, uh, you may remember that what I typically do is I put, I, I talk about the birds that are not sparrows, but that sometimes get confused for sparrows. And then I put up slides of sparrows that are kind of similar to each other side by side. And since a lot of you have seen that presentation before, I changed it up a little bit tonight. So I'll be interested to know, um, I'll be interested to know what you think about what I've done tonight. What I've done tonight is I've taken birds that are not sparrows, but that are sometimes confused for sparrows and put them side by side with the sparrows that they look most like. And so we're gonna do a non-sparrow sparrow kind of a comparison and contrast. So we'll see, um, we'll see how it goes. Um, and if you don't like it, you can just jump off the call and I'll never know the difference. So the native North American and South American sparrows used to be in the family Emberizidae, I think is how you pronounce that, Emberizidae. And then there was a, a DNA study done in 2015, uh, and, and, the, and the sparrows were lumped with the buntings at that time in, in Berezidae, in that, in that family. But there was a DNA study that was done in 2015 that showed that the sparrows and the buntings really aren't that closely related. So in 2017, they moved the sparrows um, into their own family called Passerellidae, 
And the primary impact of that is that it changed all the field guides. So everybody had to go out and buy a new field guide because it moved where the sparrows are. So it was a great economic move, but I don't think it made a lot of uh, difference to the average birder. Um, because these species, the sparrows that we're talking about, the native North and South American sparrows are, uh, are native to North America. They're federally protected by the International Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And this is something that um, I think everybody, but everybody who's birding should really at least have some knowledge of this act because this act makes it illegal to trap, possess, kill, harass, or harm these birds in any way. It's illegal to disturb an active nest, uh, to harm an egg, or actually it's even illegal to possess a feather um, of a bird that's covered under this act. And it, it's true, this covers all North, native North American species, not just the sparrows, but all the warblers, the woodpeckers, everything. And the, the exception to that is that the game birds are uh, covered under different uh, hunting and game laws. But all of the native uh, North American birds are protected in some way. Okay, I'm gonna give you just a second to read this because I really like this uh, quote. So hopefully some of you remember Andy Rooney. Andy was the guy who did the remarks, the closing remarks at the end of each episode of 60 Minutes on Sunday nights. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of people share uh, Andy's views of sparrows. But tonight, what I hope to do is uh, to convince you that, that sparrows are definitely more interesting than Andy Rooney thought they were. So <laughs> the general characteristics of, of sparrows um, that distinguish them from other birds uh, are that, um, first of all, that they're many colored. Um, they're not brightly colored like the warblers and the buntings and those things. They're, they're mostly brown. But and, and because of that, a lot of people call them little brown jobs or LBJs. But really, if you look at the sparrows, at which we're going to do um, ad nauseum tonight, uh, you'll notice that there really are a lot of different shades of brown. There's blacks and whites and yellows and reds and oranges and greens in the sparrows. And so they're not really just little brown birds that are difficult to see. They're, they're really much more than that. They're also characterized mostly by having uh, intricate patterns, especially on the head. And we're gonna talk about the, the facial patterns in a little bit of detail on the next slide. And the other thing you'll notice about them is they have pretty thin tails uh, compared to some of the other birds that they're often confused with. Their tails are, are typically pretty thin. And they also have small bills, but they're conical. They're not sharp and pointed like the warblers. And we'll, and we'll look at that in, in a comparison photo but uh, they have small conical bills. So those are just kind of the general characteristics uh, that will help you figure out if the bird you're looking at is or is not a sparrow. So these, these, this is my only um, photo like this where we got a lot of detail. So don't, don't panic, it's not a, a presentation of, uh, of, of that type. But because the facial patterns on the sparrows are so important to their identification, it's worth taking a minute to just talk about these, these two pictures and the terms that are on, these, on this slide. It's not so much critical that you remember every single mark on the sparrows' heads, but if you can at least get a, some familiarity with, with them, and then you'll, when you're out birding with other people and somebody said, oh, look, the bird has a mallard stripe, you at least know to look at the, you know, at the throat of the bird and not at the tail or you know, whatever. So, um, the, the picture on the left, I think, is actually probably a song sparrow's head um, because song sparrow is one of those mm -hmm. birds that has pretty much all of these marks. So what I'm going to do, uh, since I don't have a pointer, a way to do a pointer tonight, I'm going to start at the top of that bird's head and just go clockwise around the bird real quickly and just talk about uh, each of those terms and each of the marks, um, and then we'll move on from there. So the median crown stripe is the stripe right across the top of the head, and it's oh. bordered on either side by the lateral. Right. I lost you. Lost. Somebody got lost. Nope. Okay. Keep going. Median crown stripe right across the top of the head. The lateral crown strip stripes are on the side of that. Not every bird has all of these marks, um, but many of the sparrows have many of them. Moving down from the lateral crown stripe, you have the supercilium, which is also sometimes called like the eyebrow of the sparrow. It's that it's the area right above the eye. Uh, that is usually um, pale if it's if it's there if it's distinct, and then um, the eye ring is the ring that goes right around the eye. Uh, some birds have it, some birds don't, 
In some birds, it's bare. So it's like a skin that's a different color that stands out. And in other birds, it's feathered. Then there is the eye stripe. And what you see on this bird is a postocular eye stripe, which means that it's just behind the eye. It's not in front of the eye. And if you look to the picture at the right, the picture on the right shows an eye stripe that goes all the way through the eye and all the way to the bill. And that is an important field mark in some birds as we're gonna find out here a few slides down the line. So the, the eye stripe can either be a complete eye stripe like the bird on the right or just postocular like the bird on the left. Uh, the nape is, is the back of the, of the neck. The mustachial stripe is the one that comes down from the gape of the bird. So the gape is where the two parts of the bill, the upper mandible and the lower mandible come together. And the mustachial stripe is based right at the, that gape and comes down the side of the face. The submustachial stripe is the one underneath that, that in the, on this bird is a kind of a wide white stripe. And uh, it's usually the widest of, uh, it's usually wider than the mustachial stripe or the malar stripe, which is the next one. So the malar stripe comes down from the bird's lower mandible, the, the bottom part of the bill. Um, the distinction between the throat and the chin is not often really emphasized in field guides. And in most birds, it's not critical. There are a few birds where the chin and the throat are different colors, but the chin is the area immediately under the bill. And then the throat is down below that. And then the top of the breast starts about where the, where the little black streaks go across and make a little necklace on this bird's picture. And then, as I mentioned, the, the, there's a lower mandible and an upper mandible, which are, are just the two parts of the bill. And the culmen is the top ridge of the upper mandible. And then the lores uh, are the area, is the area between the eye and the bill. It's just a little small area right between the eye and the bill. And then the super laurel is right above that. And really what it is, is it's the very front part of the supercilium. So anybody got any questions about that? I, I know I went through it quickly, um, but again, it's kind of tedious, so. All right, so moving on. Uh, the next thing I wanted to do was just talk a little bit before we jump into the actual pictures of the sparrows is to just talk a little bit, especially for anybody out there who's listening who might be a new birder. And I've got just a couple tips here that I think apply not only to sparrows, but just to building, to birding in general. And the first thing I would say is leave the, if, leave the field guide in the car. Um, I, I see a lot of people who are out in the field birding and they're looking at the bird and they're trying to flip through the book or they're looking at an app on their phone now more often than the book. And my, my advice is watch the bird. Every, every second you have with the bird, spend the time looking at the bird and, and you can figure out what it is later. Because um, what, uh, what you should be doing rather than flipping through the book and, and, uh, and, and trying to figure out what the bird is while you're looking at it is taking notes really i think and sketching the bird writing down everything that you um that you see and that you hear and that you observe about the behavior of the bird a lot of people now are taking pictures including me i've started taking photos but unless you're an accomplished photographer like phil or like mary it, you know by the time i get my camera out get it turned on get it focused find the bird you know the bird is gone and then i even if i'm lucky enough to get a picture when I get home and look at it, I, I can't always, you know, it's not in focus or it doesn't have the right field marks to, in view to tell me what the bird is. So photos are nice, nothing against photography, but if you're, if you're really just starting out birding, spend your time looking at the bird, uh, observing it and really thinking about, and, and for me saying out loud what I'm seeing is helpful, even if I'm by myself. Um, I talk to myself all the time when I'm alone and especially when I'm out birding, what I find is if, if I say, oh, that bird's got an eye ring, it's got wing bars, it's got you know, stripes on the breast. If I say it out loud, when I get back to the, to the car to look through the field guide, I may not remember specifically what the eye ring looked like, but I'll remember hearing myself say, oh, I said that bird had an eye ring, that bird had an eye ring. And then the other thing that I, I don't do as much as I used to do, uh, but I've got a couple of examples here from my field notes is, is sketch what you see. And you don't have to be an artist. I mean, I'm certainly not an artist. And on the left, you'll see, this is one of the early notebooks uh, that I kept. And this was my life olive sided flycatcher. And I just, you know, drew a quick sketch of it. And I just have words written around the margins and around the picture of the bird and just arrows pointing to, you know, the different things that I observed. And then after a few years, I, I got a little more sophisticated. And I, some of you who've been around me a long time may remember the Schmid bird ID system where I had flow charts and, um, 
And then I have these pictures on the, like on the right where I have created for, for both, I think for sparrows and raptors and shorebirds and gulls and vireos and some of the waders. I had developed these little field note sheets where if you filled in all the blanks, then theoretically you could go back and work your way through the key and, and figure out what the bird was. So, so I, again, it's just, just a, just a quick, um, you know, plea for me or suggestion for me that you might want to spend, spend as much time as you can observing and noting what you're actually seeing with the bird. Okay. So with that in mind, let's talk about some sparrows. Um, so how that's a male house sparrow on the left and a Harris and an adult Harris sparrow on the right. And um, the house sparrow is not really, um, it's not really, it's a, not a native North American sparrow. It's not a Passerella die sparrow. This is a bird that was uh, brought for, they're native to Europe and Asia and they were brought to New York in 1851. And by 1900, just 50 years later, uh, they had colonized the whole Eastern half of the United States and they were all the way to the Rockies. And now I think you can probably find them, you know, everywhere in the world. So these birds are not feder federally uh, protected. And when I moved uh, to Minnesota, one of the things I did was I put up bluebird houses in my yard. And I noticed that my neighbor had bluebird houses too. And I, you know, assumed that I was probably going to have a house sparrow problem. And I was surprised that I didn't. And uh, my neighbor who has the bluebird houses is a 92 year old uh, German immigrant. And I met him out at the mailbox one day and I introduced myself and uh, he's, hi. And I said, hi. And I said, I noticed you have bluebird boxes. Yeah. And I said, do you get bluebirds? Yeah. I said, uh, well, I've just put up a couple boxes and I, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that we, we just really don't have house sparrows around here. And he said, no. And I said, yeah, do you know why that is? I shot him. I said, you, you shot them? 17 of them. Yeah, I shot them. They're gone. I can't shoot the house wrens though, can I? I said, no, you can't, you can't, I'm sorry, you can't shoot the house wrens. They're, they're federally protected, but the house sparrows aren't. And so I'm blessed to have a neighbor who shot all the house sparrows in our neighborhood. So I don't have house sparrows to contend with. So what you'll notice, uh, the differences between these two birds, if you're trying to tell them apart, um, the house sparrow has a black bill the Harris sparrow has kind of an orangish pink colored bill. The house sparrow has a gray crown. The Harris sparrow has a black crown. And you'll also notice that the, the house sparrow is kind of a rich reddish chestnut brown on the back and the, and the nape where the, um, the Harris sparrow, the rest of that body is really kind of a pale sandy brown with a lot of gray in it. So those are just some, uh, some differences between those two birds that, that could be mistaken for each other. So that's a male house sparrow. This and, a, and an adult, her, a male house sparrow, adult Harris sparrow. This is a Dixissel on the left and a Harris sparrow immature on the right. And I've, I've had people uh, say to me sometimes, you know, that, that they think this is a female Harris sparrow, uh, but actually you can tell the difference in age between the Harris sparrows because the adults have the black in the face and on the crown, like you see here. The immature Harris sparrows have the little black necklace that goes across the, you know, the bottom of the throat and the upper breast, but you can't tell if this is a male or female. This Harris sparrow that's an immature could be a male or a female, and the one on the previous slide that's an adult could be a male or a female. And even when we band them and we have them in the hand, we often can't tell male from female. But the thing, thing you will notice uh, between the Dick Sissel and the, and the Harris sparrow here, if you, if you look at the size of the bill in comparison to the size of the head, you'll see that the, the dick sissel has a pretty large silver, it has a silver bill, first of all. Um, most of the sparrows, the sparrows don't have black and silver bills. Most of their bills are either kind of a yellowish or a pink or a beige color uh, or gray. They don't have the, the, blacks, the black sparrow, like the black bill like the house sparrow or the silver bill like the dick sissel. But you'll notice on the dick sissel, that bill is really large compared to the size of the head where on the Harris sparrow, it's much smaller. And then of course there is the difference in color. The Dick Sissel has a little bit of a, of a submustachial stripe and a little bit of a, of a supercilium, but it really doesn't have a distinctive face pattern where you see there's a lot more, a lot more distinctive face pattern on the, Harris, on the Harris sparrow. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the other house sparrow. This is the female. Uh, which is much uh, plainer and much more drab than the male. It doesn't, doesn't have the black throat and, and the markings. But again, you see it's got a heavy bill and it's kind of bright yellow 
uh, which you're not really going to find in, in most of the sparrows. And again, it has a very plain face. It's just a very plain drab, uh, un, mostly unpatterned bird. The bird on the right is a white crown sparrow, an immature. And just like the Harris sparrows, you can tell the white crown immature from the white crowned adult, uh, but you can't tell male from female. So this white crown sparrow could be a male or a female. You'll see that it has a really reddish cap and uh, an orange bill. And again, that bill is compared to the rest of the size of the head, to the size of the head, it's fairly small. All right. And this is the adult uh, white crown sparrow. And um, again, it's very, it looks very different from the immature. The immature birds can be really confusing. They can be confused for other sparrows. I know the, the first time I ever saw one, I was down in Texas. I had no idea what it was, but I sketched it all out and got back to my car and looked at my field guide and then I figured it out. So the other, the other characteristic of white crown sparrows that I like to point out is they're, they're pretty flat headed like Yvonne. And um, they have kind of a, kind of a long thick neck uh, com compared to other sparrows and even really other birds. They're just, they just are really kind of long through that part of their body. And, and their body is also long. And it just gives them kind of a unique profile, I think, that you don't, you don't see uh, in many other birds. And white crowned sparrow and white throated sparrow are pretty closely related. I'm gonna go back to the white crowned sparrow because I wanna point out that it does not have a white throat. It has the black and white, as the white median crown stripe, it has the black lateral crown stripes as the white supercilium and the black eye line. It's black and white pattern. The white-throated sparrow also has that, but it has a white throat. So it's not just a clever name. Uh, white-throated sparrows are quite uh, variable. Um, in fact, there's a, a race of the white-throated sparrow that's called the tan striped. So where you see white and the head stripes on this bird, uh, they, can, they can be tan in the tan striped. And I, I haven't read any recent papers, but I know all through the years, there's been a lot of um, debate about whether they're different species, different races, whether more prevalent in males or females to be tan or white. And I know there's all sorts of theories, but, but for us as birders, the thing to know is that when you're out there looking at birds, you can see them either way. You can see them with, with the real white in the head stripes, or you can see them with the real tan and most anything in between. Uh, the white in the throat is also kind of variable, uh, somewhat with age. And so these birds, th this is a really nice photo, Phil, of a real classic white-throated sparrow, but unfortunately they're all not that distinctly patterned. So you just, but you want to watch for the head pattern and some amount of white in the throat. And also no streaks on the breast in this bird, except the juveniles. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Oh. Okay. Uh, another uh, Non-sparrow that sometimes gets confused for sparrows is the house finch, the female house finch. The males, of course, are are red and not likely to be confused with um, a sparrow, but the females are quite plain, uh, quite brown, and really kind of brown and gray. And so that's a house finch on the left, and that's a fox sparrow on the right. And um, I put those two birds together because among the uh, among the sparrows, the fox sparrow is the one that really has the most streaking on the underparts, but it's kind of a reddish brown. And I, I don't think you would probably usually confuse a fox sparrow for anything else. They're very, very distinct. They've got the gray in the head and the gray on the nape, and then this really beautiful rusty brown um, color. But the other thing I liked about these two photos is they're both faced the same way in profile. And it really, again, shows that the house finch has the heavy bill with the curved culmen big bill compared to the size of the head, where the fox sparrow has a thinner bill, more pointed, still conical, but pointed and yellowish, uh, and much smaller in comparison to the size of the head. So I, I just think that's a, that's a nice comparison of a typical non-sparrow and a typical sparrow side by side. You'll also notice the house finch is very plain in terms of the, the face and head pattern. There's no real pattern on the head and um, really not much, you know, not much variation in the color of that bird at all. Okay, this is one um, that is really, really often confused with sparrows. I, <laughs> Bob's laughing because this is one of the birds that, this is the bird that got Bob and me started in our friendship. He came in one day at Fontenelle Forest and said he had seen this really cool sparrow and he just couldn't, you know, just was sure he had a new species, right? So, um, so this is a red wing black, female red wing blackbird on the left and a uh, song sparrow on the right. And I put these two together because they, they both are very, 
uh, very streaky and, and modeled uh, and patterned overall. But there are some key differences here. And one key difference, and, and I mentioned this on the characteristic slide back at the beginning, the red-winged blackbird has a really broad tail that, that and when it's perched, it fans that tail out. And most, most sparrows, you really just don't see that. Um, the red-winged blackbird also has a very heavy bill and it's kind of a silvery black, uh, which you really don't see very much in the sparrows. And again, it does have some head pattern, but not a whole lot of different coloration and contrast in the head pattern. And the, the streaking on the underparts of the bird and the breast and the belly is, is really very, almost like a modeling, whereas like it's modeled as opposed to being streaked or striped like the song sparrow on the right. And if you look at the song sparrow, when you first glance at a song sparrow, you think, oh, you know, it's just brown. But if you look at that, there are, there are numerous shades of brown on that bird. The, the head is kind of a reddish brown. Um, the um, mallard stripes are really dark brown. Sometimes they almost look black. There's some gray in the back of that bird. The, the wings are kind of beige colored. And if you, if you study the sparrows, you will see every shade of brown in these birds. And, uh, you know, if, unless, you, unless you hate brown, <laughs> they're really, they can really be quite beautiful. So that's red-winged blackbird and female and song sparrow. Okay, so good news, folks. This is the halfway point. We've been through half of the slides here. Uh, this is also a red-winged blackbird. Um, this is a bird that I photographed uh, at last June, June of 2020 at, at Carpenter Nature Center in, uh, on the Minnesota side by the pond. And I don't know, I, this bird must have just gotten out of the nest this very day. I mean, it doesn't even have its eyes open. I mean, I'm sure it can open its eyes. But uh, that is also a red-winged blackbird, very, 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 very young bird. So hopefully everybody's still awake, even though the blackbird's not. Okay, another bird that um, looks pretty sparrow-like is the pine siskin. That's the bird on the left. And specifically, I think it could easily be mistaken for a savanna sparrow. Uh, but again, um, broken record here, so I apologize for that. The pine siskin does not have a face pattern. I mean, there's no pattern on the face, particularly at all. The crown's a little bit darker, but there's really no stripes to speak of. Um, some pine siskins have quite a bit of yellow in them in their wings and their tails, but not all of them. I've seen some that have no yellow. And if you're looking at the bird from this angle, um, you, you can't see the yellow in the wings and the tail really anyway. You can see a little bit in the undertail coverage there, but, but you can have some pretty plain looking pine siskins pretty um, without yellow. But again, very little face pattern and their bill is really, really tiny and really sharp and pointed and really black. And the bird on the left, the Savannah Sparrow, um, again, in contrast, has quite, quite a face pattern. And actually, I think probably the, the bird that you would most likely confuse, confuse a Savannah Sparrow with is a Song Sparrow because they are, they are patterned and colored very similarly. Uh, some savanna sparrows have yellow in the uh, super laurel era, area. Um, this particular bird has just a little bit of a yellow tinge, you know, right behind the bill on that in the supercilium. I've seen some savanna sparrows that have, you know, pretty bright yellow there and some savanna sparrows that have none at all. So that's quite variable. But the best field mark to tell song sparrow from savanna sparrow is the length of the tail. And if you look at the song sparrow, you'll see that the tail is about the same length as the body, not exclude, not, or not including the head. So if you just kind of look at that distance from the, uh, from, the, from the neck of the bird all the way down to where the tail starts, it's about the same length as the length of the tail. And if you look at the savanna sparrow, the tail is about one third the length of the body. And I find that um, to be one of the really easiest field, field marks to tell these two birds uh, to tell these two birds apart um, when I see them. Anybody got any questions at this point? All right, we're moving on. Um, indigo bunning, female indigo bunning or immature indigo bunning. And I'm not sure, I, I, don't, I don't know that you can tell for sure uh, all the time in the field whether the immatures are, whether you've got an adult female or an, an immature female. Uh, but anyway, the bird on the left is an indigo bunny. Um, some of them do have some blue in the wings and blue in the tail, and some of them don't. This one is, you know, very plain. 
And the bird that I paired that, the sparrow that I paired that one up with is the uh, Lincoln sparrow. Lincoln sparrow is on the right. And the reason that I think sometimes these can be, these two can be confusing is that they both kind of have that, uh, they can hold their feathers up on the back of their head and, or, and do, all birds can do that, but these birds tend to do that um, more than others. And it gives them kind of a, a crested look. And uh, they both kind of have the same posture with the tail cocked just a little bit. And uh, some of the indigo bunnings that you'll see, the young indigo bunnings uh, are more streaked even than, than this one. Um, so again, uh, not much of a face pattern or head pattern on the indigo bunning and not very much variation in color where the, the Lincoln Sparrow has the uh, kind of the buffy wash across the breast and these really fine, well-defined streaks on the, the breast and the flanks. And it's got the head pattern. And again, the bunting has a pretty heavy silvery colored bill and the, the Lincoln Sparrow as is typical of sparrows has a smaller um, duller colored bill. Okay, so I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, we talked about um, sparrow bills versus warbler bills. So we have an oven bird on the left here, which is a warbler, and we have a vesper sparrow on the right. And you'll notice they both have the big white uh, submustachial marks, those big white, uh, big white kind of swoops that come down from the bill and go under the, the auricular, under the face. And they both have kind of a white eye ring, but the oven bird has the sharp pointed warbler bill that's thinner and not conical shaped, not, not shaped like an ice cream cone like the, the Vesper Sparrow does. Uh, the oven bird is very uniform, kind of an olive brown uh, on the back where the Vesper Sparrow is gonna have some streaks like we talked about earlier. They tend to have a lot of streaks on their body. And, um, and then the uh, Vesper Sparrow uh, that has a little rufous patch right at the on the shoulder on the bend of the wing on the in the lesser coverts and some of them really have a lot of that and some of them don't have as much but it is a good field mark for vesper sparrow if, if it's got it so between the eye ring the little sub submustachial swoop the rust on the coverts and then the white in the tail uh, those those are the things you want to look for on the vesper sparrow and Vesper sparrows are sometimes best identified in flight because when they fly, when they fly and fan their tails out, it looks like a junco tail. It's got the white, the, the two outermost tail feathers on each side of the tail are white. And you can see that when they fly, just like you can see that on a junco. And here's, here's a fun one. Uh, it, it, at one time, it was thought that long spurs and sparrows were, well, it, it was thought that they were very closely related, and they are closely related. Um, they're, they're not in the same family anymore, but, but probably of all the other birds we're talking about tonight, the long spurs are the ones that are most closely related to and most closely look like the sparrows. Um, so they're, they are patterned and uh, colored very much like a sparrow. There are four different species of long spur, but the, by far the most common one in the areas where we live in Nebraska and in Minnesota is the Lapland long spur. So that's the one I'm, I'm talking about tonight. The thing about long spurs is they're almost always in large flocks. They're almost always flying and they're almost always in open areas. And if they land, they're gonna land on the ground like in a field uh, <laughs> where you can't see them. So behavior is a really good clue to separate out long spurs because you're looking for a large flock of small birds that are flying around, flying around and flying around and they all kind of swoop down on the ground and disappear. So that, that's actually probably the best field mark. But if you, get, uh, if you get a look at one like this, which is an amazing photo, Phil, um, what you'll notice is that there's, the rufous color on it is, is limited just to the wing. So the secondary coverts and the tertials on the, on the wing, the feathers that you can see when the bird's wings are closed, those feathers have a rufous wash to them and there's no reddish or brownish anywhere else uh, on the bird. The face pattern is there. It's not as distinct as some that you see in sparrows, but again, um, uh, it, it is there because these birds are closely related to sparrows. The lark sparrow, I, I think it would probably be more easily confused with the long spur than any other sparrow because it really doesn't look um, too much like any other sparrow. It has a very distinct face pattern with the little uh, rusty color on the auricular or the 
kind of the cheek down below the eye there. And then it's got the, the you know, the eye stripe and it's got the malar mark. And then the, the really uh, distinctive feature of the lark sparrow that will help you identify it in the field is like the Vesper sparrow, if you see it in flight, it's got a lot of white in the tail and you don't so much notice the white on the sides of the tail when the bird's in flight, you notice that all across the bottom, it almost just looks like, looks like it's got a little white necklace at the very end of its tail because the tips of all of its tail feathers are white. And, and that's a really good field mark for, for that bird. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, chipping sparrows and tree sparrows and clay colored sparrows here for a few minutes um, because they're all, uh, they're, there's a lot of uh, connections between these birds as you're gonna see here in a minute and also field sparrows. So tree sparrows, American tree sparrows are mostly here in Minnesota and Nebraska in the winter. Um, they usually show up pretty late in the fall or early in the winter. They're not usually here in very good numbers when other sparrows are migrating. And they have rusty caps and they have these rusty marks on the, on the face. They have the rusty postocular uh, eye, eye line and the rusty colored mustachial stripe. And the other thing, if you look real closely at this photo, and this is probably the, the uh, most popular field mark for this bird, it has a bicolored bill. The upper mandible is grayish and the lower mandible is yellow. So there's, and, that, and that's, a, that's, I think that is, I can say that's unique to this bird that I don't think any of the other sparrows have a bicolored bill like that. And on the right, you have a chipping sparrow. And, and a lot of people see tree sparrows and they think chipping sparrows because of the rusty crown, but chipping sparrows don't have rusty crowns in the winter. Uh, this chipping sparrow is an alternate plumage, which means it's in its breeding plumage or its spring and summer plumage. Uh, when these birds molt in the fall, the chipping sparrows lose that rusty crown. They may retain a few feathers through the winter, a few reddish feathers, but they basically get a brown crown. So at the time that the tree sparrows are here, the chipping sparrows don't have rusty crowns anymore. So that's that's a, a key a, a clue that if you see a rusty crown sparrow, you might you might have a tree sparrow. So. Um, I mentioned earlier that a lot of sparrows that normally don't have streaks on their breast do have streaks on the breast when they're juveniles. So the bird on the right is a juvenile chipping sparrow. And uh, even as a bander, even when we have th some of these juvenile sparrows in our hands, it's sometimes really super difficult to tell what they are because uh, a lot of them look very much alike. But the good news is for, for, uh, for us birders is that they don't carry that plumage very long. All of these birds molt uh, their body plumage in the fall. So even though they come out of the nest looking like the bird on the right, by the time sparrow migration is happening at this time of year, they look more like the bird on the left. So the bird on the left is uh, a chipping sparrow. Um, it could be a young one, it could be an adult. I, I can't tell from the photo, um, but you'll notice that it's, it, it's uh, head pattern is much different from the one on the previous slide. I'll go back. You can see that it, it's uh, the crown is not as rusty. It's more brown. The eye line is not quite as distinct. It's it's a little bit different looking bird for the winter. And then we're going to throw in the clay colored sparrow now. The, the clay colored sparrow and this is an alternate plumage, so spring and summer. Uh, it's pretty distinct. I mean, it's got the dark. It's got the white. Uh, median crown stripe. It's got the dark, uh, dark brown, um, later, uh, uh, lateral oh. crown stripes on the side of that. It's got the really pale beigey brown uh, auricular right under the eye there, that like cheek patch. And it's got a white throat. It's, it's got a really subtle but very distinct and beautiful face pattern and, and doesn't really look much like any other bird in alternate plumage. So it's, it's a pretty easy one to identify most of the time, as we'll see in a minute. But where it's really where it really gets crazy is um, in the winter, because chipping sparrows and clay-colored sparrows look almost identical in the winter, and the the key field mark between these two birds is the eye line, because if you look at the bird on the left, which is a chipping sparrow, you can see that the eye line goes all the way through the eye and all the way to the bill. It's really small between the eye and the bill, but it's there. The eye line goes all the way to the bill. If you look at the clay-colored sparrow, you'll see that it's only a postocular eye stripe. The eye stripe does not go all the way to the bill. The area between the eye and the bill is, is 
um, just the same color as the rest of that part of the face. So um, that when I'm looking at a bird that I know is one of these two species, that is the thing I key in on as to whether that eye line goes all the way to the bill or whether it doesn't. And when we're banding, that's also the one of the key things that we look at to make sure we've we've got the right species here. But if yeah, if you look at those two birds, I mean, other than that, man, those two birds look a lot alike. Okay, so um, next is the field sparrow. Field sparrow also has a rusty crown, like the tree sparrow and like the alternate plumage shipping sparrow. But the rest of the face is very plain. And the eye ring is, is more distinct on this bird than on the other two. And the other thing that's a really good field mark is that this bird has a really pink bill and really pink feet. So, um, and it looks pretty much like this all year round. So this is, uh, this one is one that uh, lacks some of the facial marks that the other birds have. And again, has the really pink bill and pink feet. Now, when we were banding um, this spring, there was a bird, there was a sparrow that was uh, singing in a tree. It was in this, every time we were out there this spring, it was in the very same tree singing the very same song. And when I transferred, I did this presentation on my computer, which is a, um, uh, which is not a Mac, uh, not an Apple product. And I'm presenting on my wife's computer, which is an Apple. And for some reason, the sound didn't carry across. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to play the sound on my phone. And I think you'll be able to hear it. I hope you will. Um, I'm going to start the recording and about four seconds in, you're going to hear the song. Then about four seconds later, you'll hear it again. And then about four seconds later, you'll hear it again. So here we go. That. That, can you hear it? Yeah. Okay, one more time. Okay, that's the song. And this bird was singing that song over and over and over. It was there every day, right by one of our nets in this tree. And I played that song uh, for several people and they said they thought it was, um, they thought it was a field sparrow. It doesn't, and that's what I thought it was. It doesn't sound exactly like a field sparrow song, but it, it, that's what it's close to. So then when I, when I was out there getting the recording, I was also able to get some photos of the bird. And that's I the bird. It. Okay. Yeah. And that is not a field sparrow. <laughs> that looks uh, very much like a clay colored sparrow, but that is absolutely the bird that was singing the song. I mean, you, its bill is even open. And even at my age with my hearing going, I could hear the bird singing the song. So I, I took several photos of it and I came home and I, I started looking closer at the photos. And if you look at that photo where the red arrow is, there's a band on that bird's foot. So I blew it up and I can read enough of those numbers <laughs> that I figured out what bird it was. We, it was a bird that we had banded. So um, what I was hoping was that because it was singing in the tree right by the net, right by a net that we would catch it again and we never did. So I know which bird it was, I know the band number and um, it's, we banded it as a clay colored sparrow. We banded it before, you know, before we knew that it was the bird with the weird song. Um, and so what we have here is we have a, a cross between a field sparrow and a clay colored sparrow. And I, I sent the pictures and the song off to uh, probably four or five different researchers that people I, you know, could find on the internet that had done sparrow uh, studies. And I haven't heard anything back from anybody yet, but there are other um, there are other instances of people finding field sparrow, clay colored sparrow crosses. And uh, we had one on our banding site this, this spring. So it was, uh, it was actually pretty cool. I, I got way more excited about it than anybody else, as you can imagine, but, uh, but it was pretty cool. We, uh, we got a kick out of it, so. Okay, so I think there's just about three more slides left. Uh, and this is swamp sparrow. Um, and uh, this is another uh, bird that we uh, have, we caught quite a few of. We didn't catch so many this fall, but we caught quite a lot of them last fall and also this spring. And I learned some things about swamp sparrows that, uh, that I didn't know. So the way you tell a swamp sparrow is first of all, uh, no stripes underneath, very, very plain breasted. It also has a pale, a really pale throat. And I've seen swamp sparrows with throats much whiter than what you see here and, and almost to fool you to think it might be a white-throated sparrow. 
but again, they have the, post, the really dark postocular uh, eye stripe. And what I think, the way I always describe them is it looks to me like they have dirty faces, like they need to wash their faces. They have that dark stripe behind the eye and they have these little dark spots uh, all over their, you know, in places on their face. And the bird on the right, you can see that under the eye, it's got some, looks like it needs to be wiped off. And behind that, it's got some little spots. And they have a plain crown. And this is one of the things I learned um, that you can, in, you can sometimes tell the age and the sex of the bird by the color of the crown. Mm. Because um, young birds, and especially females, and even some adult females don't have any rust in the crown. And it's the adult males, uh, like the one on the right, that have all that rust in the crown. And I used to kind of use that rusty crown as a field mark when I was birding in the field to identify swamp sparrows. But it turns out that I would say most of them, at least most of the ones we banded, don't have rusty crowns. Uh, a lot more of them look like the bird on the left where they have the, the dark brown crown. Uh, so the other thing you'll notice about the swamp sparrow is it does have a lot of rust color in the wing and they have kind of a brown wash on the flanks and the bird on the left uh, shows that more than the one on the right. If you look like right under the wing on the left side of the bird, you can see there's some brown color, uh, brown in there and that brown wash on the flanks is also a good field mark. Okay, um, these are two uh, grassland sparrows that are, um, that are um, a, a lot of people's, uh, you know, high on, on people's lists, especially the Henslow sparrow, high on their target list. Um, very, they're in the same genus. And so they're very similarly marked and very similarly shaped and pretty much the same size. The three big distinguishers between these two species the grasshopper has that little uh, orangish yellow color right above the eye in the super laurel era, area. Doesn't always have that. Uh, so it will either be there or it will be absent, but it won't be yellowish green like the Henslow sparrow. The, the Henslow sparrow has kind of the greenish yellow um, supercilium. The grasshopper sparrow has a very plain breast. The Henslow's has those little tiny, really fine black streaks on the sides of the breast. The grasshopper sparrow does not have a mustachial stripe. The Henslow sparrow does. And sometimes, it, it, I mean, it's not very big and it's not very wide. It's not, not gonna jump out at you, but the Henslow sparrow almost always has that little tiny black mustachial stripe that comes right down there from the gape in the bill. And then of course, if, you can, if you're lucky enough to be young enough to be able to still, to still be able to hear these birds, <laughs> they sound very different, but I have of course have learned that I can no longer hear grasshopper sparrows, so. And I think Neil Ratzleff has the, a good story about that. So, but I won't tell it for him. The Henslow sparrow photo is absolutely beautiful, I think. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Nice. Nice. Is that, that's one, is that one of yours, Phil? I think it must be. It's not marked as being somebody. Uh, I'm, I'm not that's sleeping. It. I just could hit a uh, mute quick enough. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Probably yeah, Phil. I, I mean, I, I, I commented on Phil's. Phil's talents at the beginning, but I, it's way understated. I mean, Phil is Phil is an amazing, amazing accomplished bird photographer. So yeah, he's got some beauties for sure. See, the secret is take a lot and then you'll get a few anyhow. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And I think we got one slide left and that we were talking about these two at the beginning of the presentation because everybody's out looking for these two right now. Uh, I was lucky and I, I did find a Leconce in Olmstead County uh, last week. <laughs> I've been able to find a Nelson's up here. In fact, I haven't ever seen a Nelson's in uh, in Minnesota. It'll be a state bird for me when I finally find one. So they're rare. What's that? I say they're really uncommon on Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that that are identified. Yeah, nope, because they're, they're kind of a, they're a sneaky little bird. Frequently uh, low down and in and around the grass and stuff. Yeah. Yep. And usually by water, sometimes I think they're out there. The yes. first one I ever yeah. saw was out on a mud flat with, with a bunch of cattails. And I was looking at it through a scope from, you know, 30 yards away. I wasn't even anywhere near the bird. Uh, but the, I, think, I think I would have to say Leconce is my favorite sparrow. Uh, I just think they are absolutely <clears> beautiful. I was, uh, I was down in Olmstead County by Rochester last Tuesday with a friend of mine named Neil Skoog. And uh, we found one and this bird had some sort of, uh, I don't know what, uh, attraction to us or something because it was like just feet away from us. And it sat for the longest time 
And of course I had left my camera in the car, but Neil got some amazing photos of this bird really close up. Then it flew over and sat on the fence for about probably 30 seconds. We got more photos and then we walked over by the fence and the bird went into the weeds and then came back to the fence. It was just absolutely a, you know, a, a yeah, birder's bliss moment. Um, but again, both of these species are, are very closely related and look very much alike. Key differences are uh, the nape. They both have gray napes, but the Nelson Sparrow on the right has a plain gray nape. The Leconce on the left has these sort of like little purplish spots and streaks on the nape. Um, the Leconce has pale gray lowers. The Nelson's has yellowish orange lowers. So if you look between the eye and the bill, you'll see that the Leconce is kind of gray and the Nelson's is, is pretty orangish colored. And then the Leconce has fine dark streaks that go down the side of the body. And the Nelson's is much less streaked on the under parts. And also the Nelson's, the yellowish orange color goes a lot farther down onto the upper breast uh, and is a lot bolder than most, most birds, most of, most of the Nelson sparrows, much more so than the Leconce. If I can tell a story. You uh, can. Well, first of all, I'm gonna give Mary credit for part of this, for a lot, big part of this is the, the uh, Leconce really respond to pissing. And uh, I don't have my camera on, uh, that's okay. Anyhow, they really respond to pissing well. And also they, they, they're very active in the morning about what, what is it, Mary? Nine o'clock east or so, they're not so active anymore. Is that what you found? Yeah, what I've found, and, and I have to give Elliot Beto some credit for this because Elliot and I would go on out and looking for Leconce. And what we found around here is if you get out there at sunrise, you're pretty good shape. But by the time nine o'clock rolls around, they're done popping up for you. And, and the one we had last week was right, at, right before sunset. It was like at six o'clock in the evening. So maybe low light. Maybe, maybe they're crepuscular. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but for active, yeah. yeah. And one, one other story, I do have a lot better Nelson's barrel pictures to send you because of when I was with Mary and crashed my car. And uh, <laughs> so some, someone wants to know what happens when you go in birding and you have a car crash, you keep going and get pictures of Nelson's sparrows. Hey, cool. Ah, I, I want a picture of the deer. <laughs> I got a little bit of deer hair on the corner of my uh, fender right now. I haven't taken it off yet because they can't, they can't fix my car until November sometime. Okay. But the deer got up and ran. We don't have any photos. Oh, no. man. But we got Nelson's photos. We got great <clears throat> Nelson's photos. We had a very cooperative Nelson Sparrow. That's really cool. Yeah. For about Rick. a half an hour, and I can tell you that three quarters of the pictures, the bird's eye <clears throat> is behind the weed. So they're <laughs> always, yeah. So yeah. lots of pictures. Yep. Yeah. Did, some, I, did somebody have a question? Yeah, I have a question about the lark sparrow. Um, All right. I got kicked off somehow this meeting when you were right at the beginning. It took me a while to get back in. But the lark sparrow, the tail looks rather broad. And you were talking about most sparrow tails are thin, right? Yes. Is that just, is it just fanned out, flared somewhat? I think so. Yes, that's what yeah. I would say. And and I also Did you hear the question. I think sometimes birds that have that there. really uh, conspicuous um, coloring like that in their tail might flash their tail more, and it might be in a mate attraction thing, or it might be a predator diversion thing. So you might, in a bird like a lark sparrow, a sparrow like a lark sparrow, you might see it more of a tail flash than you would in some of the other birds, like you see in juncos. Yeah. I really like the way you rework this. Rick. Thank you. That really, it's really helpful. I mean, because there's a there's a few of these these sparrows that I I struggled staring at them, but seeing them in context with the birds that you're confusing them with really really is helpful. Good. Thank you. I personally still have trouble between savannah and song and all those with the streaked breast. So, that it did help though. Doesn't Savannah also have a fork tail? You know, um, I, I don't know. I, it's, hard to, it's hard to see. Well, well, and the other thing, 
The and, tail and is one of the main characters, so yeah. Yeah, I. This is the other thing that that we've learned this year. We banded a lot of sparrows this year, and uh, there's a couple things I'll say about that. The first one is that tails are the most likely feathers on a bird to get uh, adventitiously replaced. So the birds will lose their tails either from stress or from yeah. predators. And so you see all sorts of crazy combinations of old and new feathers. You see old feathers and new feathers coming in and tails are really variable. Um, and then the other thing is that they're also extremely susceptible to wear and especially yeah. on sparrows because they spend a lot of time on the ground. So I'm, I'm I'm not saying that they don't have fork tails or that they do, but but I'm saying that um, I don't rely, even as a bander, I don't rely as much on tails um, as I used to, just because I see so much variation in the condition and the, uh, the wear of them. I don't always rely on, on, on close, you know, habitat. You start lo looking for savan savannah spurs, you go right to proximity to water, it always seems like. And go, you know, you go out to Wanahu and some of that area around there, they, they just pop right up. And uh, I don't think that songs for, for, are in that area as much. So the other thing I didn't say about these two, because it's very subtle, but it, it is another field mark that I use to distinguish these two. It, it looks to me like on a savanna sparrow, somebody kind of took, grabbed it on the front of the head and just kind of pinched it down because it has a much narrower, the way that, the way that its head comes to the bill is narrower. And it has a smaller, narrower, uh, more pointed bill than a song sparrow. And if you look at a few song sparrows and a few savanna sparrows, you can start to see the difference, just this really subtle difference in the head shape, especially on the front of the head. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was down, I'm in Washington County, Nebraska, um, on County Road near Boyer Chute. There, it was on a, the ditch had water in it. And I thought they were song sparrows, but then I thought Savannah. Um, song sparrows hang out by water. They breed by water. Song mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. And sa Savannah? Uh, savannahs, you will find, well, I think what Bob was saying is, well, in Nebraska, you only have savannah sparrows on migration anyway. Yeah. And I think that it's not uncommon to see them by water on migration. Okay. Yeah, so, so I might have had both. Is what I, I just I sometimes think the song sparrow is a little more bolder and um, mm -hmm. it's bigger. Yeah, and just it just seems like a chunkier, heavier looking bird mm -hmm. than Savannah. <clears throat> well, I kind of feel like it's. I agree with what Rick was saying, and then Scott has put in a a note to you chatting that he thinks tail length is easier to is an easier ID between the two. And I agree, the song sparrow just has a much longer tail. Okay. Yeah. Again, the tail is about the same length as the body yeah. where on a savanna, and that's assuming that it has its tail, <laughs> right? It's full grown tail. But yeah, in general, that is, that's what I use when I see them. And I've seen savanna sparrows that have pretty heavy breast spots too, because a lot of people say, well, you know, yeah. song sparrows have breast spots and savannas don't. And, that's not, now, that's not necessarily. Now, if they're singing, then you can tell, but they're not singing right now. Right. Yeah, you know, and that's the other thing. And, you know, as a bander, sometimes, many times we say, even with the bird in our hand, you know, we don't know. Yeah. We don't know if it's a male or female. We don't know if it's a hatcher or after hatcher, right? And sometimes when you're out in the field, you see a bird and you, you don't know what it is and that's okay. And sometimes it's a clay colored sparrow that sings like a field sparrow. <laughs> and, right, you don't know anyway. That's not in your field guide, right? So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They don't. They don't read the same books we do. And and the more you get out there, the more you learn. That's right. It's true. Thanks so much, Rick. Sure. Thanks, Rick. And I'd really be interested in finding out what you hear back on this clay color field sparrow cross. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I haven't. You know, this all happened six months ago, and I haven't heard anything yet. So I'm. I'm kind of not feeling like I'm. I'm feeling like I'm not going to hear anything. Yeah. I think you were stood up. <laughs> it's happened to me before. Yeah. I'm going to make one announcement before everybody bails here. Scott, you've got you've got the, a, a very uh, timely uh, field field trip out at Fontenelle in the wetlands. Now, 
as somebody who volunteers out at, at, at Fontenelle, I, I have to, somebody, somebody mentioned to me that they saw this and we want to make sure that everybody plays fair now and, and does the, the proverbial, either you're a member or, or it makes an attempt to, to, to cover the fee. So I don't, don't uh, just, you know, bail down there and, and then just and uh, cover. So I, that's my due diligence. Um, so, but otherwise it sounds like a, very timely trip down there to the wetlands. I haven't been down there for a while, Bob uh, or Scott. Where is there a, the same parking we need down there? New, new uh, boardwalk um, and new bridge. Oh, I don't, but you can't meet in the building. No, the building is totally. <laughs> Biding their time to, to tear that down for what the second or third time, right? Oh. I, and it's it, well, we didn't we didn't tear it down last time it flooded. We well the time before when it flooded we rebuilt it, but yeah, we re remodeled it. At a pavilion, something that will allow water to go up the legs of it or something like that. It's yeah, yeah the, one, the once in a million year flood happened twice in three years, so that, yeah, that kind of shot things. And this last flood was tore it up pretty good, so. Mm -hmm. But they, but they they did what uh, I think they realized that they had to do, which was sink some money in, in a in a bridge down there. If you remember, they had that bridge built, really nice bridge, and that huge tree landed right on the bridge, and everybody mm. was talking about how they'd spent the money. And 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 uh, Ray Ray Tur or said, let's let's just cut up the top of the tree, and the, the the tree runs right across where we wanted to do, and. And leave the leave it buried underneath. It was pretty funny, but that that didn't last very long either. So this is a this is a ten foot concrete pilings bridge. If that bridge goes away, we've got more problems. I mean, you start start looking for the apocalypse here. Yeah, it's time to give up then. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you, Rick. I really appreciate it. This is really helpful. I and okay. like I said, he laid it out is is perfect. I, I really well, then I think uh, I I think I'm on next month too. Is that right? I'm sorry. I'm not, I've got to announce it. Uh, we, you guys have to endure another month of of, uh, of Rick. He's uh, he's he's doing he's doing not shorebirds, but he's doing waterfowl and ducks. Right. Right. Waterfowl in November. Yep. Yeah, and that is November 11th, same time. It's seven o'clock. So get your get your uh, you know your your waterfowl on on board here. We're really looking forward to that. Bring your hunting permit, hunting licenses. <laughs> Buy your ducks down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right. Good well, job, Rick. Thanks. Yeah, we thanks Thank everybody. Too. That was really a good bunch. So, and, and Neil and Deb are on too. Yeah, I saw them come on. They've been pretty quiet though. Yeah, he's, he's that muted. was on purpose. <laughs> I thought Neil was gonna was gonna tell his breeding birds survey story. But we'll save Which that one, for another time. Which one? The one in Minnewara can't hear can't hear the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I, I can give you a bad time about that because I can't hear him either now. So now, decreasing results <laughs> on grasshopper sparrows caused me to drop my route finally. <laughs> like, where did they all go? Yeah, oh, wait, there's one. Them. Well, what's happened to them? Sorry. Nothing happened to them. Just happened to me. So are <laughs> exactly. you saying I'm still needed? You're still <laughs> needed, Deb, without a doubt. <laughs> he, there's no way he could have heard that bird. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Good, good turnout, and we will have that up on the on the uh, ASO YouTube channel if you got somebody that missed it that wants to see it. We've gotten pretty good pretty good turnout for that. So, thanks Great. again. Say hi to Margie. I will. Thanks, Bob. Take care. Bye. Take care, guys. <laughs>